Welcome back. When the Clive Trio broke up in 1955, you were, what, around 25, uh, sorry, 20 years of age at that stage, Howard. And, uh, that, that, that sounds a good we, we took it down a bit there. That yeah. was good. No. You were determined to make a, a career in showbiz by that time. You knew what you yeah. wanted to do. I think the quartet was formed a little bit after that time, and uh, it emerged onto the New Zealand entertainment scene. Hello, Howard. When I first met you and the quartet in 1954, I knew that at last New Zealand had an act of international calibre. Uh, do you recognise that voice? That's Rabbi Levin. <laughs> <laughs> Please welcome, Benny Levin. <laughs> yep, it's one point to Howard. <laughs> You'll have a chance to get it back in just a moment, however, Benny. Uh, in fact, I was going to introduce you and say that you're probably one of the, the best known figures in New Zealand showbiz from the terms of uh, being a promoter, a household name in that area. Uh, when did you first see the quartet? Remind Howard about that. Well, Howard, it was a, a wonderful day in my life. Uh, the Ritz Hall in Rotorua right. in 1954, we were working there over the Christmas New Year period. And a friend of ours in Auckland said, you've got to go down to Rotorua. He'd seen you there a week before, and he said, you've got to see these guys for yourself. And when I came down and I saw the group and I saw what was there and what was there for the future, I knew that New Zealand had an act that could never be surpassed, and it has never been, and never will be. We had an engagement. First professional fee. Right, fellas? <laughs> five <laughs> guineas. <laughs> no, no, no. A king's ransom. <laughs> no, you, no, you, no. you paid these guys five guineas for their first no, professional job? it was a job. Little, little more than that. It was eight pounds, including your travel. <laughs> 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 you, you really believe in giving the money away, Benny, don't you? Oh, well, you? you know, those days, you know, wages were only £10 a week, and that was wonderful. Oh, so you, now you're saying they're actually overpaid now, so you want, some, <laughs> <laughs> you want a little bit of change out of them as well. Change. What was the most magic moment for you out of, uh, out of that whole time? Well, I think from the time that we had the association in 1954 and the very, very personal friends that we became and still are, I think the most wonderful moment was when Howard rang me from Australia in 1964 and said, the quartet is breaking up, would you like to set up the farewell tour? Mm. And it was marvellous because ten years had elapsed, we'd done a lot of things together, a lot of other things had happened in between time, but when Howard rang me it was just incredible and I've never ever forgotten it and never will. That's well I had to go back to the start, Benny. And they say it all goes in you, circles. You yeah. don't go anywhere in the future unless you look back well, what's happened before. Benny Levin, thank you for joining Howard. Thank you, Brian. Benny Levin, ladies thank and you. gentlemen. Thank you, well, Benny did a great job helping to establish the quartet as a quality entertainment act, but you still hadn't broken into the big time. Uh, one evening you were performing in Auckland's Colony Club and you were approached by this particular gentleman. Hey, hey, what? What are you doing, you Finbach? And I don't think I have to say who this is. You recognise him, obviously. <laughs> Harry Morris Miller. <laughs> Harry M. Miller from Sydney, here to join you. Uh, <laughs> 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 have you got permission from Mum? <laughs> <laughs> well, where do you start? I mean, well. The Howard I Morrison Quartet. Socks on. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It was the, it was Harry, the Quartet Harry? plus. Harry, okay. Harry. <laughs> you got <there. laughs> Tell Howard about that first meeting, will you? Well, the very first meeting was at the Colony Club, Bob yeah. Sell Colony Club, and he sold us a meal after the show at half price. <laughs> and I sat down with Howard and the boys because I thought they had enormous possibilities, enormous. And I offered them, for a record company that I had just starting off, a guarantee of a thousand pounds, I think it was. I didn't have the thousand pounds and we found that out pretty fast. Uh, but <laughs> nobody ever offered them a guarantee. That's right. And yeah. we signed an agreement. We became, I guess, sort of blood brothers, all of us. And we went on and had a hell of a lot of fun, a few ups and downs, and it just went on from there. Hmm. Well, I mean, it, it was the Hart Morrison Quartet Plus Harry M. Miller, really, it was almost, there were, there were five names out there in the end, and it was a magical period in showbiz in this country. 
Um, I mean, you, the records that you broke into, uh, there's a great story around those, aren't there? Well, well, we, 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 had, we, had, we had a lot of success with the record business. Um, and um, we, uh, there was a fellow called Lonnie Donegan who used to do mm. parodies on things. He did a show, a, f a song called My Old Man's A Dustman. And we were driving mm -hmm. from Auckland to Wellington, that terrible Jaguar car, the five of us. That's what he put up for collateral. <laughs> <laughs> right. What do you reckon the car was worth? <laughs> Six quid. Yeah. <laughs> Five. Yeah. Yeah. According to Benny, that's good money. Yeah. <laughs> so you said you wouldn't interrupt. I'm sorry. <laughs> so, so we were driving to Wellington, thinking about how we're going to get this song. Now, we've all claimed the idea for the song over the years. However, the boys all wrote it, driving from Auckland to Wellington. And they came up with a song, with Jerry in the back with his guitar, uh, called My Old Man's An All Black. Right. We started to put it in the show on tour to polish it up to make a record. La Gloria Records, being the goers that they were in that day, they put out a release <laughs> and we had sold 40,000 records to the dealers. Not only hadn't we produced a record, we hadn't even made the tape. <laughs> 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 because the song was already banned <laughs> by the NZBC. Yeah, yeah. Good old Lionel Skeets. Uh, hi, Lionel. Uh, <laughs> I've got a real surprise for the NZBC and TV One tonight. Yeah, we're going to make a lot it's of my money. Show. Yeah, no, but, <laughs> but I'm making the money out of this night. So we, we made this song and we decided that we would record it Pukakoi. Well, the last Town Hall. Pukakoi Town Hall. About 800 people sitting there and it was the last night of the whole tour. So we've got Bruce Barton out with all of his bits and pieces. And I came out on stage about, I don't know, half past 10, quarter to 11, told the audience that they were going to be part of history, because this was a record that was already banned by the NZBC. And we hadn't and, made it. And we hadn't made it, <laughs> and we were going to sing it. And their applause and enthusiasm was really important, etc. So it'd be, and it'd be all on the record and they could buy it. Well, quarter past 12, we were still trying. I looked at Howard and Howard looked at me, we were getting a bit worried. So I said to the stage doorkeeper, lock the bloody doors, these <laughs> bastards, they're going to stay there till we get it right. <laughs> <laughs> and at quarter past one, we finally got it. That's right. Actually, you, you flowered up the, the, uh, the tape was actually a Phillips tape, man, just off the side of the stage. The plastic little microphone. Uh, uh. Well, over and of, over again. Some of the great showbiz legends of our country come out of that era. Harry, on a world scale, briefly, how, how would you rate the quartet? See, one of the things about the boys, which, which I think is really important, with, and that I saw at the very beginning, was that I saw them making an enormous business internationally. Mm -hmm. Enormous. And I saw where I was going to go uh, on a management area. For instance, tonight, I must mention this, um, this is a national show, is it not? Well, it depends what you're going to say, Harry. I'm <laughs> very good. I just want to say, they don't have the rights to play those black and white tapes. Oh! <laughs> you found that out? <laughs> I, think, I think we're getting close to a commercial break, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank Mr. Harry Miller a great deal for coming here. Well, Harry Miller, ladies and gentlemen. Whoa! <laughs> Coming up, coming up, some faces that'll be familiar to more than just the star of our show. But first, a tribute uh, from one of the all-time greats. We taped this just a few hours ago. We've cleared the rights on this, by the way. The king of twist, Mr. Chubby Checker. Hi, you folks down there in New Zealand. Chubby Checker from Nashville, Tennessee. Howard Morrison, I'll never forget. 1960, we traveled all over New Zealand, and we did this great tour. I went to Rotorua, and he took me around all the Maori people and showed me everything. The point I'm making here is that he's a perfect New Zealander. The guy represents the country very well, and if I can still remember, he's just a perfect kind of guy. So I tell you, Har I wish you all the luck, Howard. Life is not over. Life is just beginning. And I'm still wondering, Howard, when are you going to run for public office? <laughs>